2017 Australian Sailing Hall of Fame inductees, the team of Australia 2. Australia 2 captured the hearts of our nation when it won the America's Cup back in 1983, breaking the home nation's 132-year winning streak in sport's oldest trophy. The America's Cup fascinated the Australian sailing community for more than two decades, proving elusive for six Australian challengers. Not this time. A syndicate of West Australians, headed by businessman Alan Bond, formed Australia's best prepared syndicate ever, Australia 2. Designed by Ben Lexon, the 12 metre class yacht Australia 2 featured a unique winged keel, and whilst highly controversial, it proved the secret weapon in Australia's challenge for the Cup. Skippered by John Bertrand, the crew of Australia 2 displayed a never say die attitude coming from 3-1 down in the best of seven series. The men from down under fought their way back to take the regatta to the seventh and deciding race. A less than ideal start in the last race meant the Aussies had to claw their way back yet again, forcing an incredible heart-stopping tacking duel to the finish. When they crossed the line ahead of Liberty at 5.21 p.m. on September 26, Australia marked its place in sailing and sporting history. The team of Australia 2, Australian Sailing Hall of Fame inductees in 2017. It's a, an event that stopped our whole nation. And John, can I ask you, as, as the skipper, um, were you aware of the enormity of the, the impact of, of what you'd achieved back here in Australia? Um, uh, no, not to the level. No one could have uh, figured that, you know, no one could have speculated, I don't think, the. Uh, what was happening here in Australia. We, uh, we got rid of all of our television sets. We, we got rid of all newspapers being delivered to the, uh, to the cruise quarters. We wanted to go into our own bubble and close ourselves off to endeavour to you know, give it the best shot. But uh, you know, there was the only uh, person that was able to come through from Australia was my mum on the telephone and, and Billy Osborne, who was a wonderful mentor of mine. And, uh, but to understand the full significance of what was happening here, you wouldn't have been able to, f you know, just there's just no way you could have imagined what was happening, no. John Longley, uh, the Royal Perth Yacht Club knocking over the New York Yacht Club after 132 years of trying, but it could not have happened without Alan Bond. Was he a, a one-off? Will we ever see another, AB? Oh, you may well, um, but uh, you couldn't have done it without Alan. We couldn't have done it without Alan. I mean, we all know the story. Uh, you know, Benny Lexon, or Bob Miller as he was then, of course, walking through the Mamaroneck boatyard in New York with Alan, um, coming across Valiant, that was one of the beaten America's Cup uh, defenders uh, for the 70 America's Cup. And uh, Bondi saying to Benny, well, or Bob, as he was then, you know, what's that? And, uh, you know, and um, Benny giving him a 30-second history on the America's Cup. And he said, oh, let's go and have a look. So they jumped up on board. And almost immediately, this little short, round guy called Vic Romano leapt up and told him to bugger off, you know. And, um, and Bondi turned on him, just turned on him savagely. He says, listen here, mate. Benny's going to design a boat, or Bob as well. Bobby's going to buy the boat. We're going to come back here and we're going to rip this thing off you. <laughs> well, Alan was 34. You know, let's put that into perspective. He was 34. And, of course, that's what he did. It didn't come back next time. He did it in 74, and it took four goes to do it. And, um, you know, the America's Cup, you need to have lots of goes to do it. And if you think about that, it puts him in there with the, um, you know, the, uh, all of those famous... Uh, uh, Lipton with Bick in more re Vanderbilt in more recent times, Bertare Bertarelli, Ellison. So Bondi's up there with them all, and we certainly couldn't have done it without Alan. John, uh, on, on that score, uh, in, in the balance of the scales with the wing keel, where did that balance fit in terms of the actual performance and also the intrigue and the psychological advantage that it gave you in keeping it secret from the Yanks? Well, the wing keel, the wing keel was, you know, extremely important. But um, 
the psychology, as it turned out, was more important than we could have ever imagined. Uh, we had the audacity to keep the, the boat covered, and th that had never been done anywhere in the history of the Cup up until then. And our credibility during the summer was such that uh, we, we had a very good success rate against the other nations, you know, the Canadians and the Brits and, and um, the, uh, whoever, who, who else we had to, French, what other buggers, Italians, yeah, yeah, any rate, <laughs> whole heap of them for about five, how many races did we have, Jim? The Dapto dogs, yeah, the Daptos, the Daptos they, they were the, <laughs> yeah, any rate, they're all pricks, <laughs> just to put it in context, you know, so, with, so everyone's clear, and, um, but the psychology of it was actually a big deal, particularly the final race, where you look back on it, and the, the, you know the Americans were pretty quick. They were, they they built three boats, and they selected. Well, when I say were they, there were a whole bunch of U.S. syndicates, but Dennis Connor, uh, syndicate built three boats, and he selected the best. And they were, they found a really nice loophole in the rule where they could reduce the weight and increase the sail area depending on the wind strength. So they were pretty quick, uh, highly competitive. But I guess looking back on the final race, some of the decisions that perhaps they were making was they were under enormous uh, self-induced pressure. And you have to say that was part of the psychology. They didn't know what they were racing against with the, um, you know, with this boat that was covered up all the time. So that was a big deal, as it turns out. All stuff between the ears on the 11th hour, yeah. Grant Summer, do you remember that moment when the wing keel was revealed after the final race for all and sundry? What were yeah, your feelings? It was, a, it was a very late night in Newport when we came back in that night and, uh, and there was a, quite a show, you know, famously now we've all seen Bondi put, you know, pull the skirts aside and, uh, yeah, it was quite a party in Newport that night. And you, um, heavily involved in Oracle's America's Cup Triumph, where does 1983 sit in perspective for what we're seeing today? Well, uh, each time you win the cup, it's pretty special. It's pretty special and it's a product of a lot of work. So uh, San Francisco in uh, 2013, we were 8-1 down, backs to the wall day after day, and uh, the boys fronted up and did the job each day. Tommy Slingsby's here somewhere, was a strategist on that boat. Incredible team that, that pulled that off. And uh, Glenn Ashby, who, who copped that, you know, nobody should have to cop that, but he, uh, he copped that and then he just won the cup again more recently. So uh, 2013 was special for such an incredible comeback, you know. Um, Jimmy Spittle never, never flinched the, the whole way through that. And then turn the clock back more than 30 years and the same thing's happening in Newport, Rhode Island, you know. Backs to the wall every day. Lots of postponed, delayed starts, races that didn't get off. And, uh, you know, it's the comradeship between these blokes here, even if their hair's changed colour over the years, <laughs> has, uh, is amazing, you know. Like, it's like a team of brothers, even 30-odd years later. So uh, you, can't really, you can't really compare them, but... Uh, Hopefully Slingsby will standing up here in 30 odd years time talking about something that happened in 2013. John, I guess that all of these wonderful people and those that are no longer with us or can't be with us, um, it changed your lives forever. Uh, it's a cliche, but is that the case? Well, well, yes and no. Obviously, you know, in terms of the exposure and whatever, it was, you know, massive. But no in terms of, you know, the relationship, you know, that we are, we're war veterans. You know, we're blood brothers, that'll never change. And I just love when we get together as a, as a group of people that, uh, you know, we're just sort of interested in, you know, we just want to know how everyone's doing. We're not really interested in talking about th the last race or anything like that. It's, it's this beautiful friendship that, and this bond, bonding that we had that we, you know, we went, we went through a hell and back. Um, Everyone was ill immediately after the America's Cup. You know, we, co we competed for seven months. We had four days off, seven days a week, four days off in seven months to give you an idea of the intensity. And really the day after, everyone became ill and it took me and uh, the other guys, you know, maybe three or four months to really recover from that. Normally you go into a rehab hospital. You don't go and party. <laughs> and people, people think, you know, what were the parties like? Well, they weren't. People around us partied. 
But the beautiful thing, and this is the beautiful thing I love, is all we want to do is just be with our, with our, 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 our crew and our loved ones. And that's all. And it was this beautiful inner sanctum that is something that, uh, you know, will remain with us for the rest of our lives because, you know, these, these boys, they climbed Everest. You know, they're the first to do it. And uh, it was hard. It was hard to do that. No one had ever done it in the history of, of sailing. So um, there was a unique X factor associated with this group of people up on the stage here. John, is there anything you can add to that? We weren't professional sailors. We're just a bunch of blokes, really. And we're just lucky enough to be there. Our paths of our lives had all met there. And, and suddenly we had this incredible event had happened to us. And it's 30-odd years ago, and I still think about it at least once a week, if not more. So it changed our lives. It absolutely changed all of our lives. And we are so goddamn lucky that we were one of the people that were associated with that amazing time. Just before I salute you and sign you off, there's a young man standing behind me here, Guy Gillies. Come forward, Guy. Yeah. This young gentleman is representing Ben Lexon, and he was raised by Ben Lexon for the first 13 years yes. of your life. Yes. He was like your step-grandfather. He was my father, really. He was your father. Yeah, um, my teacher. Just a little close. Tell my us about this amazing journey you had with Ben Lexon, and it continued after his death. Uh, yes, it did. Um, he, as I said, he was my father, a teacher of life. Um, uh, the work that I do today is because of him. Um, but yes, when when he passed, I think you're talking about this. Um, I had for years many dreams of Ben visiting me, and um, we'd be working on boats and things in the workshop, and um, I'd wake up very upset but uh, over the years um, I sort of grew out of that and um, Yvonne um, passed away three years ago and um, the morning that she passed I walked into work and believe it or not Men at Work was playing and I just felt everything had come full circle and they were together again and it was just a beautiful feeling for me. Isn't that a wonderful note to end our tribute to Australia too? <laughs> Inductees into the Australian Hall of Fame, the magnificent crew of Australia too. Ladies and gentlemen, I think if there is one thing of which we can all be certain, we will never forget that moment that Australia too crossed the line in Newport, Rhode Island. Well done, guys. Thank you. Thank you.